Speaker of the National Assembly is about to take her seat, take the presiding seat to commence the proceedings. Of the day. With his reply to the two-day State of the Nation Address debate. With that said, we are crossing over to the City Hall now for the proceedings to start. Now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. <laughs> Please be seated. You didn't get medication today, it's meditation. <laughs> I realize the Honorable Singh has joined the chorus of meditation, of medication. Order. Anyone speaking? Order. The secretary will read the order of the day. A reply by the president to debate on the state of the nation. The honorable the president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker of the National Assembly, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Deputy President of the Republic, David Dabe de Mabuza, Ministers and Deputy Ministers, the leader of leaders of political parties here present, as well as the Deputy President of the Governing Party, Paul Mashatile, Honorable Members, in the State of the Nation address last week, I said that a nation is defined by how its people meet the gravest difficulties, whether they work together and confront their challenges as one, united by a common purpose, or whether they surrender to the problems before them. The same can be said of their elected representatives. As we, the elected representatives of the people of our country, gathered here in this house, we have to ask ourselves whether we are able to work together to confront the challenges of our nation, united by a common purpose, or will we be consumed by our differences, and in doing so, surrender to the problems that beset our country. The debate on the State of the Nation Address over the last two days has done much to emphasize our differences and to reveal the extent of political contestation in our society. In a way that is to be expected, and even welcomed in a vibrant and robust democracy like ours, we must expect such contestation. The debate has raised important issues and some constructive suggestions have also been put forward. But there are those in this house who instead of being what I would call merchants of hope, 
have cast to themselves as merchants of despair. They have determined that their political fortunes are best served by depicting our country, South Africa, as being in chaos instead of being parties that acknowledge the challenges and that are determined to work together with all of us to find solutions. Rather than present a balanced assessment of the state of the nation, they have instead resorted to dishonest and self-serving rhetoric. Rather than acknowledge the grave damage caused to our country by what has ensued in the past, such as state capture, by the effects of a devastating global pandemic, and by the worst public violence in the history of our democracy, some of these honorable members have failed to come up with practical suggestions or solutions that can resolve the many problems that our country faces today. Some chose to belittle and even to deride what has been achieved over the last five years in the midst of extremely difficult conditions because it does not serve their political interests to recognize the progress that has been made and progress that is plainly clear to everyone who cares to look. The contributions that they have made may serve their electoral aspirations, but they do not serve the interests of the people of South Africa. The task we have as elected representatives, as I said, is to emerge from this debate with a common determination to meet the challenges of the present, but also to renew the promise contained in our Constitution of a better life for all. Where people began to doubt the promise of our Constitution, it is our job to restore their faith in our Constitution. Not through words, but through action. To do so, we must reflect deeply and honestly on what has gone wrong, on where we have strayed from the path we set out in the first place. As the Honorable Prince Butelezi rightly said in his remarks, which were delivered by the Honorable Singh, what South Africans want is honesty, fairness, justice, and to know that their government is capable and willing to do its job. At the same time, we must reflect on the progress that we have made and real progress. And we must concentrate on the actions that we need to take now to overcome the challenges that face us. Nobody can deny the distance we have come over the past five years, nor can anyone deny that our country has been struck by successive crises that have severely impeded our efforts to improve the lives of our people as we would have wanted to. We inherited a state hallowed out by corruption and malfeasance and an economy in steep decline. Since then, we have rebuilt the capability and restored the independence of institutions that are essential in our democracy, institutions that had been weakened. We have reinvigorated, reinvigorated entities like the South African Revenue Service, the National Prosecuting Authority, the Special Investigating Unit, 
to fulfill their mandates effectively without fear or favor. That we have done. The tireless work of the State Capture Commission and the investigating directorate is now bearing fruit in the prosecution of those alleged to have been involved and responsible for state capture. We face up to the worst global pandemic in a century and marshaled an unprecedented response to save lives and to protect livelihoods. We implemented a new social grant which has reached more than 11 million people. We supported over 5 million workers who would otherwise have lost their jobs and provided tax relief and direct support to thousands of businesses and helped them to survive. Indeed, Honorable Masango, South Africans need hand ups and not hand outs. That is why our unprecedented expansion of public employment programs has proven to be a great success. And they've also proven to be an effective tool for mitigating unemployment when not enough jobs are being created by the economy. The presidential employment stimulus has created work and livelihood opportunities for one million people to date, most of whom are young people. We have implemented far-reaching economic reforms to restore confidence in our economy and that is why investors are looking at our country with great interest and many of them investing. We've opened the way for private investment in electricity generation for the first time and released Spectrum to harness the potential of the digital era. For a province like the Northern Cape to have attracted a hundred billion rand in investment in just a matter of three years must mean that something is cooking and happening. We have successfully mobilized new investments in factories, production lines, call centers, and the Western Cape is teeming with a lot of call centers that are being set up here. It's largely because of the work that is being done by the national government, whether you like it or not. Farms and mines are being invested in across the country. These have created jobs and opportunities, including for small business. Special economic zones in Gauteng, have been set up because international companies have seen that we really mean business and we are indeed embarking and implementing the reforms that we promised we would make. This represents real progress to rebuild our country and to recover from what we lost. Despite this progress, however, we face steep challenges. South Africans are worn down by power outages, water supply interruptions, rising crime, and instability in local government. That, we admit, several speakers in the debate raised the need for effective and urgent implementation of the tasks outlined in the State of the Nation Address to address these challenges decisively over the next year. Now, the ANC is not the only party that is in government, in various entities, government structures. And one of the speakers here stood up and said, just be careful that as you throw stones, as you throw stones, do remember that you also live in a glass house. 
because the same could be happening to your side as well. And we do not need to go through a litany of the various failures that we are experiencing at local government level. And this affects all parties that are also in government in various centers. The important thing, though, is for us to realize that we have a common problem and we've got to find common solutions rather than to stand here and throw stones. Foremost amongst the actions that are needed for the resolution of our challenges clearly is the electricity crisis. As we said during our address last week, we do not need another plan. We need to accelerate the implementation of the plan that we have already put to the nation in July last year. We have already taken a number of important steps to reduce the severity and frequency of load shedding. The measures which the Minister of Finance will announce in a week's time in his budget will boost the rollout of rooftop solar by business and households. To end load shedding, however, we must shift gear. A crisis of this nature demands a coordinated response and it demands urgent action. That is the reason why I'm appointing a minister in the presidency and the reason why a national state of disaster has been declared. As I said last week, cheers, cheers. Now, now, focused attention requires us to do a whole number of things. And as I said last week, this new minister will assume responsibility for overseeing the various aspects of the electricity crisis response. The minister will be responsible for driving the various actions being coordinated by the National Energy Crisis Committee to end load shedding as a matter of urgency. The reality is that the resolution of the energy crisis requires effective coordination across several departments and public entities. It requires the undivided attention of a political principal who does not need to split their time, their energies, amongst different important responsibilities. This appointment will ensure that there is a minister who is ultimately re responsible for resolving load shedding and who is able to work with all fellow cabinet ministers, departments, and entities also. Some have suggested that the appointment of the minister will cause confusion and fragmentation and that it might also result in tough wars amongst the ministers who deal with energy and ESCOM. That is not the case. This minister will be focused day in and day out only on addressing the load shedding crisis, working together with the management as well as the board of ESCOM. The minister will be leading the National Energy Crisis Committee and interacting with all other departments. In a spirit of cooperation, or cooperative governance. The Minister of Na Mineral Resources and Energy deals with matters of energy policy as well as mineral resources. Beyond the energy crisis that we face, the restructuring of government will be effected to enable entities that fall under various departments to be properly located in those departments. And the Minister of Public Enterprises is executing the recommendations of the Presidential Review Commission as well as the State-Owned Enterprise Council that I appointed. 
in relation to the ownership and governance of state-owned enterprises, that function should be completed in time as we continue with the restructuring of government. The Minister of Public Enterprises will therefore continue to work on the restructuring of ESCOM as well as other state-owned enterprises until then. With the focus that the Minister of Electricity will have on load shedding, and the work that is being done by ESCOM and the board, I do believe that we stand a much better chance to address this overriding challenge and crisis that our country faces. And through this effort, we should be able to bring load shedding to an end. As Minister Mantasha said, urgency of execution and delivery is paramount. We don't have the luxury of time. Now, several speakers in this debate have argued that the national state of disaster is unnecessary or that it will allow for abuse of the system. And some have even suggested that it will allow for the abuse of financial resources. This includes some leaders in this very house, in the opposition, such as the Premier of the Western Cape, who as recently as last month was writing me a letter and holding media briefings calling for a state of disaster to be declared. Now, the Honorable Brink yesterday called the, the Disaster Management Act a dangerous weapon in the hands of incompetent ministers. This is the same Disaster Management Act that made it possible for us to take decisive, effective, and agile responses to deal with COVID-19. It was this act that empowered us during that pandemic to save many lives and prevent even greater hardships. It is this Disaster Management Act that we have on our statute books that has on numerous occasions enabled us to provide urgent relief and support to people affected by floods and other natural natural disasters. The state of disaster that was declared last week will be used to mitigate the social and economic effects of load shedding and accelerate the measures that are necessary to close the shortfall in electricity and nothing else. As I said in the State of the Nation address, we will ensure that environmental protections and technical standards are maintained and that procurement is undertaken, yes, with transparency and proper oversight. We will use the state of disaster to rid of unnecessary bureaucratic obstacles that stand in the way of urgently bringing new generation capacity onto the grid. And we will use it to ensure continuity in the provision of critical services and supply chains and to address the impact of load shedding on businesses and on households. As we build on the electricity, an electricity system that will meet our energy requirements, into the future, we need to dispel some of the myths that have been circulating and that have been repeated even here about the path that we are taking. We need to dispel this idea that we are abandoning coal as a fuel source. We should all remember that coal-fired power stations provide 80% of our energy source right now and will therefore 
and will therefore continue to provide the bulk of our base load supply into the future. Even as people in international forums have asked me, I've said we've just built two mega power stations, Kusile and Midupi, that generate some 8,000 megawatts at great cost. And there's just no way that we are going to shut those two power stations down. There's just no way that we are going to do that. And I've told them that, we've told them that, insisting that we are, however, committed to a future energy mix that consists of a diversity of energy sources, including coal, renewables, nuclear, gas, hydro, battery storage, biomass, and other forms of energy. We must dispel the idea that unbundling of ESCOM into three separate entities is out of step with the international trends. The reality is that over 100 countries, including China, Germany, and Russia, have established independent transmission and system operation companies. We need to dispel the claim that creating a more competitive, efficient, and sustainable electricity generation market threatens the ability of the state to provide affordable electricity to its citizens. In fact, it enhances it. On the contrary, the reforms we are undertaking will improve the ability of the state to provide power to the people now and into the future. And the power we want to be able to provide to our people is affordable power. Our priorities in 2023 are to decisively resolve the electricity crisis, to reduce unemployment, and to root out corruption and crime. Yet, as we confront the most immediate and pressing challenges facing our country, we must also plant the seeds for future growth. We must ask ourselves, not only where are we as a country, but what kind of a country we want to be. We need to undertake other essential work now so that we can build beyond the crisis and, yes, lay the foundation for a better future for all South Africans. As a country with a young population, we have enormous potential for growth and development. The most effective way to harness that potential is through ensuring equal access to quality education. In the State of the Nation Address, we outlined some of the work underway to improve access to quality early childhood development. This is being supported by progress in basic education, where schools in poorer areas are showing improved performance and thanks to greater government support. We, we are developing vocational education and training opportunities and implementing new ways to fund workplace training programs so that we develop the skills that the economy needs. And through the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention, we are creating opportunities for young people to more easily access opportunities for employment, for training, for entrepreneurship, and work experience. By the same measure, access to quality health care, and indeed better health itself, are necessary to improve our people's lives and build a successful society and a more productive economy. We are committed to the provision of quality health care for all, regardless of their ability to pay. 
we will therefore progressively implement the National Health Insurance, the NHI, as soon as necessary. As soon as the necessary legislation is approved by this parliament. In the meantime, we are preparing for its implementation through the National Quality Improvement Plan and putting in place the necessary staffing as well as the funding that is required. We are improving the quality of care in our clinics through the Ideal Clinic Program, using the capabilities of the electronic vaccination record system that we developed for COVID-19. Now, the Department of Health will introduce an electronic health record solution to improve management of health records throughout the country. As our country and the world recovers from COVID-19, we are strengthening the fight against the HIV pandemic that we have been engaged in for more than three decades. While we have made remarkable progress in fighting HIV, as well as tuberculosis, new infections are still occurring at unacceptable rates. And we continue to record deaths that could have been prevented. We are also working to combat non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. We are paying greater attention to mental health. According to the World Health Organization, around one in five South Africans suffer from mental health disorders. Our starting point must be to raise awareness as well as to combat stigma around mental health so that people are able to seek and to receive mental health services. Beyond that, we need to dedicate more resources and qualified professionals to the provision of such services. We are working to end discrimination against persons with disabilities and to remove the impediments of their full participation in the economy, in society, and in all areas of life. Last year, we held a very successful summit on economic empowerment for persons with disabilities to improve access to resources such as land, finance capital, decent work, capital infrastructure, and labor. This year, we plan to continue this work by dealing with barriers to transport for persons with disabilities and ensuring that government institutions make reasonable accommodation for persons with disabilities in the workplace. The Honorable Holomisa has raised the issue of pensions of civil servants and military veterans from the former TBVC states. These are indeed issues that need to be considered. The Deputy President heads a task team on benefits for military veterans, which has a work stream on pensions. I have asked this task team to provide a report on this matter. And I've also asked the Minister of Finance to set up a team to look into the issue of pensions for civil servants from the TBVC states. So that work is going to get underway. And I'd like to thank General Holomisa for having raised this matter. He raised it as a real issue that needs to be addressed, and that I saw as a very constructive issue that he raised during the debate. Thank you, General, for raising the issue in the way that you did. Building beyond the crisis means addressing the fundamental threat of climate change and strengthening our country's resilience to future disasters. The ambitious carbon emission targets 
that we have set are essential to the future well-being and prosperity of the people of South Africa. Unless we act now, alongside other countries of the world, our country will experience ever more frequent and ever more severe weather conditions. More lives will be lost, more people will be displaced, and living conditions will worsen. This picture was even better, better put before us by the Premier of Mpumalanga, who spoke so eloquently about how Mpumalanga is addressing the issue of climate change and what the dangers of not addressing climate change are. And they don't only touch on the livelihoods of people, but they also touch on the health of people as well. Through the work of the Presidential Climate Commission, the Presidential Climate Finance Task Team, led by Mr. Daniel Minele, government departments and stakeholders, we have developed a clear, just, and inclusive path towards a low-carbon economy and society. Now, as we work to reduce emissions, we must undertake adaptation measures to counter the effects of climate change and design our cities, our towns, our rural areas to be more resilient in the face of adverse weather events. And this is where we need real good planners for our city outlay, even for our rural areas. We need town planners, we need engineers that are going to be aware of what climate change ravages are doing to the topography of our country. We will be reviewing our disaster management architecture to make sure that it is adequately equipped to respond to floods and other natural disasters going forward. Building beyond the crisis also means rebuilding our infrastructure. Several speakers in the debate spoke about the poor state of much of our infrastructure. And in many cases, they are right. Investment in the construction and maintenance of our infrastructure has been declining over many years. Since taking office, we have taken important steps to reverse that trend. Through Infrastructure South Africa, we have focused on building the capacity within the state to design, to prepare, and to implement infrastructure projects. You will recall that in the State of the Nation address, I did cite this as a major challenge. Now, through the Infrastructure Fund, we have sought new approaches to also funding infrastructure, drawing on a diversity of sources. We are also undertaking structural reforms in energy, in water, in our ports and railways that will enable greater investment in these vital industries. We have significantly increased the budget allocated to infrastructure across the government. And as I indicated in the State of the Nation address, significant road, water, housing, and other projects are underway. And the Minister of Finance will, as he outlines his budget, be able to focus on this as well. To succeed in all these efforts, we need to ensure that the state has the necessary resources, that it has the necessary capacity and all the skills that it can master to be able to execute all its plans. We are taking important steps to professionalize the public service across all years to ensure that the right people are appointed and are placed in the right positions, that they are held accountable and they are empowered to provide the best possible service to the people of our country. 
Further to this, I'm directing that all infrastructure and service departments conduct skills audits within a short space of time. These audits, now these audits must not just tell us what training officials think they require, but must help us understand where critical skills exist in those departments to effectively deliver infrastructure and services. The National School of Government will work with other organs of state, like the Human Sciences Research Council, the HSRC, to conduct these audits. We said in the State of the Nation Address last week that South Africa's fortunes are linked to those of our continent. We depend on a peaceful, stable, and prosperous Africa to advance our own development as a country. In April last year, South Africa assumed its two-year term as a member of the African Union Peace and Security Council. We will be chairing a meeting of the Council in Addis Ababa tomorrow. Through our participation in the Peace and Security Council, South Africa is working with other countries to bring peace to areas of conflict on our continent, such as the Eastern DRC, whose president I had a lengthy discussion with last week, with Libya, the Sahel region, and Mozamb northern Mozambique as well. In October last year, South Africa hosted and played a role in the facilitation of the successful peace talks between the government of Ethiopia and the Tigray People's Liberation Fund, which were facilitated by the African Union. Our former Deputy President, Pumzile Mlambongnuka, participated in these talks and flew the South African flag on our behalf. We will continue to provide whatever assistance we can to the resolution of conflict and peace keeping on our continent. Our recent experience of the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the value of a united response to common challenges. As the African Union Chair in 2020, South Africa led the continental response to COVID-19, overseeing a continent-wide strategy, setting up innovative online platforms to provide access for all countries on our continent, including countries such as the Caribbean, and mobilizing international funding and securing over 500 million COVID vaccines for the continent. Now, as chair of the African Union COVID-19 Commission, we continue to lead the continent on health security matters as a means of preventing and responding to the pandemic and plan for future pandemics as well. We are working as co-chair of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator together with the World Health Organization and other organizations to develop a global platform that will enable rapid development of and equitable access to tools needed to respond to any future pandemics at a global level as well. These are part of the concerted efforts to ensure that Africa and the global community are adequately prepared for any future health emergencies. While much of this work does not find its way into the headlines, the reality is that these are efforts that are necessary for the development and transformation of our country. While others make a lot of noise on the sidelines, the reality is that this government is building the future today. As a government, as we move on, honorable members, 
the values contained in our Constitution are essential in shaping the South Africa that we want. The Constitution of our country calls for a society that is based on human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. And it calls for the accountability, responsiveness, as well as openness in government. These values provide a sense of purpose and direction for all of us, individuals, families, and communities, and a shared vision of what is important and meaningful to us. To live up to these values, to fulfill this bold vision in our Constitution, we must honor them in our own lives as well. We must treat one another with respect, with integrity, with dignity, with responsibility, but importantly also with compassion. We must build a society in which people can work together for the common good, in which all people are treated with the dignity and the respect they deserve, and in which everyone is given the opportunity to reach, yes, their full, their full potential. It is these values that have set our country apart since the dawn of democracy almost 30 years ago. It is these values, too, which inform our relations with all peoples and nations across the world. We have observed with great sorrow the immense loss of life and suffering caused by the recent earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. We once again extend our deepest condolences to the governments and the people of those two countries in the face of this humanitarian disaster. As I conclude, I wish to extend my appreciation to Deputy President David Daberde Mabuza, who has given me unwavering support over the last five years. Not only has he given me support as president, he has been working side by side with me over these past five years and has executed the tasks that I have allocated to him, tasks such as heading and leading the South African National AIDS Council, the extensive engagements that he has had with military veterans, the job and the task that he has had in engaging with traditional leaders throughout the country on critical issues such as communal land and also their ability to execute their work as an important structure in the state. He has supported peace building in efforts peace building efforts rather in South Sudan and led processes around land reform amongst other things. Deputy President David Mabuza has indicated his wish to step down from his position. This is a request I've informed him I'm considering and attending to and I would like to thank him for the work that he has done for this nation and for all of us. <laughs> DP, cheers. cheers. I also wish to extend my thanks to ministers and deputy ministers that I'm privileged to work with. I thank them for 
the outstanding work that they do in the service of the people of our country. I also wish to thank the premiers of our country, all nine premiers, from the Western Cape right through to Limpopo. Even you can applaud on the other side. I have really thoroughly enjoyed working with our premiers. Yes, I am sure. <laughs> Almost, at the very least, two to three times a year, we hold our Presidential Coordinating Council meeting, and we exchange views on a number of issues, and I've always found our premiers very creative, very energetic, and uh, full of ideas, such as being able to write letters to me and say, President, declare a state of disaster. <laughs> so I thank them. I also thank, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our Directors General. The Directors General and DDGs are the real engine of our government, and I'd like to thank them together with a number of other officials in our government, and indeed those hordes of people who work in our government system, from the cleaners to the gardeners right up to the top. And, and I'd like to thank the advisors, my advisors as well, and the staff in the presidency for their hard work. And I also like, I'd like to thank my protectors as well. <laughs> A journalist asked me over the weekend whether I was ever terrified or scared. I said, no, I wasn't. And it was largely due to the fact that I have really good protectors, and I thank them. <laughs> Finally, let me thank all of you, leaders of various political parties, and all of you as members of parliament. I thank you all for the inputs you have made, the criticisms that you level at me, uh, and the suggestions that you put forward and all what you express. I really thank you because this is what makes our democracy a rich democracy. Finally, allow me to reiterate what I said in 2018 State of the Nation Address, delivered exactly five years ago today. I said we should reaffirm our belief that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. For though we we are a diverse people, we are one nation. There are 57 million of us, that's what I said then, there are now closer to 61 million of us, each with different histories, languages, cultures, experiences, views and interests. And in fact, I digress, when it comes to views, I always think that there are 61 million views. Each one of us have a different view on any issue. But I continued to say, yet we are bound together by a common destiny. We are one people committed to work together to find jobs for our youth, to build factories and roads, houses and clinics, to prepare our children for a world of change and progress, to build cities and towns where families may be safe, productive, and be content. While there are many issues on which we may differ, on these fundamental matters, we are at one. So, honorable members, 
South Africans are a resilient people. They are a hopeful people. And indeed, there are reasons for hope. But we cannot live on hope alone, as many of you have, have said. That is why Akbar Deutsch, the said African man, verdien better as unfulfilled and lier beloftes. It is the job of government to deliver basic services, to protect its citizens from harm, to create the conditions in which every person can thrive. Mushumu wa mubuso washu, nduwa uri unakise Afrika chipembe. Uitela uri batuwa hashu wa kono uchira, uchiro vune hadoba takaza. Li hezi shinera faloride, hafa noni Afrika chipembe, uri batuwa hashu wa kono vela panda zavuti. That is why, as we work to implement the actions that will restore our country's promise, I'm not asking for your patience. I'm asking for you to support our people as they work with us to address all these challenges. That's all I am asking for. Let us never forget that whatever our challenges, whatever our differences, no masituga gupi, na gupi, no ma guini, songi asfani, kotwa, oguslanga nisayo, uguti, izwe lagiti, lipumelele liye pambili. Ilogo ogustiba nisayo. So in the end, we all seek the same future for our country. It is therefore important, and I repeat, that we should stand together to build that future. But Bahai Su Babata Horibona Rikopani Rilintwelingwi Risebeta Mo Hiti Raswingwi Ipelela Amashwin. I thank you.